Are you a team manager struggling to lead your team well? Have you been asked to lead HR, but it's your first time? Or are you an HR pro looking for your tribe? While We Were Working is the show for you. With quick tips and tough topics in 30 minutes or less, the Jumpstart HR team is here for you. So let's get into it. Hey, before we get into this episode, I want to give you a heads up. Did you know that Jumpstart offers dedicated recruiting and staffing services for businesses big and small all across the country? If you didn't know, that's okay. Now you know. And you'll get to meet Cody, our recruiting manager, in a future episode. But for now, let's just leave it at if you're looking for staffing services that have competitive rates but top-notch talent, you want to work with us. We have some artificial intelligence that helps us pinpoint the exact person you're looking for in ways that are faster than our competition. And as I mentioned, our rates are competitive. So if you're curious, reach out to us at jumpstart-hr.com, schedule a call with me, with Cody, and let's help you find that talent that you need. All right, let's get into the show. Hey, what's going on? This is Joey Price. I am the co-host here at While We Were Working and founder of Jumpstart HR. And as always, I'm joined by my awesome co-host, Summer Keytron, our consulting practice manager. We've got a great show for you today. We are going to talk about the I-9 and a recent business that got in trouble for refusing documents that an employee wanted to hand over. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I can tell you some stories about that. (laughs) And we're going to talk about why employees are leaving your business and what you can do to turn that around. So we'll talk about the importance of satisfaction surveys and exit interviews. So, Summer, let's go ahead and get into the show. I'd love to. So welcome, everybody, to our show. Thanks, Joey, for that intro. So this article was an HR dive mid-April, and it talks about the Hooters franchise that settled a DOJ claim because they refused a worker's I-9 documentation. Now, on the surface, you might think, gosh, we'd never do that. But I will tell you, as somebody who has been completing I-9s for almost as long as I've been alive, I have seen every single mistake I think absolutely possible. And if you think those little mistakes don't matter, uh, I will say for somebody who's also unfortunately been through an audit with DHS and ICE, which you never want to do, uh, they will come knocking on your door. (laughs) So, Joey. Curious to hear your thoughts on this article. I mean, you have a lot of experience with I-9s as well. What do you think? Yeah, so so this story is all about uh, America's favorite wing shop, Hooters. And there's a franchisee owner uh, in Destin, Florida, uh, who has a <laughs> business and they refused uh, documentation from uh, a worker. As you mentioned, Summer, this is a, it's a, it's a small seemingly inconsequential thing, right? Uh, I don't want to take this person's documents for whatever reason, but instead I want them to provide these documents that I'm, that I'm familiar with, that I'm comfortable with. And unfortunately, what that found is that the uh, franchisee was discriminating against a non-U.S. citizen while checking her permission to work in the U.S. So mm-hmm. I won't go into the details of what happened in that scenario in particular, but what I will share to kind of make it interesting and fun and engaging is that uh, the I-9 has three types of documents that you can give just very, very plainly. So one document will confirm your identity, okay? So there are identity confirming documents. The other confirms your I guess, nationality or um, eligibility to work in the U.S. There's there's list A, there's list B, there's list C. So in your I-9, you have to give either a list A document or a list B and list C document because B plus C equals A uh, in the weird math <laughs> of, uh, of I-9s. And to, to Summer's point, you know, I know she's got stories to share, but 
I've seen business owners who will say, hey, uh, I need your I need your birth certificate and your passport. Well, for those HR nerds like Summer and I, we know that a passport is a list A document. Uh, and if you have a passport, you don't need the birth certificate. But there are uh, business owners, managers, hiring managers out there who aren't as aware of these t- things like Summer and I uh, and our team at Jumpstart. And so they will lead people down a path that almost makes it assume that the document the employer is asking for is the one that you have to give. So, for example, let's say you want to hire a uh, you're hiring a 15 year old student at a grocery store. You might say, I need your driver's license and Social Security card. Well, uh, a, a 15 year old may not have their driver's license yet but they might have their state ID card, you would have to accept the state ID card in lieu of the driver's license. Or they may say, "Uh, I don't have a driver's license. I do have my social security uh, number, but instead of social security, I want to give you my birth certificate and my state ID uh, card. So you'd have to accept those two. What I'm trying to convey is that the employer doesn't get to choose what documents the employee gives, because that is a singular reason why companies mess up with I-9 and why they get it wrong, because they'll either ask for the wrong documents or they'll discriminate, as in the case here. But let me not ramble and hog all the show. Summer, those are my thoughts. Don't discriminate. What what were your thoughts? Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that Uh, suggestion of documentation and how it's a a pretty common practice, but it's actually not allowed. And so to give some direction in in how this should be handled is to provide that list of documents that are accepted to your new employee and let them know, here's the list. Please provide us whatever you would like to that meets the requirements. And So long as the documents that they're submitting to you are not expired, and if they uh, require a signature, such as a passport, um, any other sort of document, they do have to have a signature on it. Um, Those are really important factors that you want to make sure that um, you're just, you're following the rules. And then just some other tips of things that I see, just really common mistakes with I-9s. Um, using more documents than necessary. So what do you do if a team member provides you with three docs and you know that you you don't need all of them? I go back to them and say, you've provided more documentation than we needed. I can't give you a preference of what we can accept, but here's the list, please resubmit. And then we go from there. What other common mistakes do you see, Joey? Because I feel like I have a list I could keep going down. <laughs> Oh, okay. So my favorite uh, mistake is where uh, employers ask for documentation that is in the same list category. So what I did just now is I went to the uh, USCIS website and you can, e- you can easily type into Google list A, B, and C documents. And you'll be taken to a page called I-9 Central uh, where there's form I-9 acceptable documents. So for example, um, people, employers may ask for all list C documents, which is your uh, documents that only establish your employment authorization. So that could be a social security card. It could be a uh, birth certificate. It could be a consular report of birth abroad. It could be a, a certificate of report of birth from the State Department. It could be a birth certificate from a state. Uh, It could be a U.S. citizen ID card uh, for those who are naturalized citizens. Uh, And it could be an ID card for use of resident citizens in the United States. Uh, So, for example, an employer might say, it's very common, hey, give me your social security card and your birth certificate. Well, those two documents only show your employment authorization. Uh, a list B document, everybody knows driver's license, but there's also a school record or report card. So a, a student could give a report card, could give a, a clinic, doctor, or hospital record. 
uh, even a daycare or nursery school record for those who are <laughs> under the age of 18 who can't present a uh, who can't present a driver's license, a state ID, a school ID with photograph, voter registration card, U.S. military card, a draft record, military dependents ID card, U.S. Coast Guard merchant mariner document, Native American tribal document, or driver's license issued by a Canadian government authority. So um, that's my favorite is when people mix up the documentation. So I think the takeaway here is that there's many different documents that uh, even some that aren't commonly used or that aren't commonly seen that are acceptable. So kind of going back to the, the point made in the article in regards to um, avoiding in your organization what happened at Hooters is to always double check before you decline accepting documentation i will say though there are there are circumstances where companies can decline documentation i've i've had this happen many times and it's when you receive documentation and there's a very valid concern that it's not authentic documentation so if you receive any sort of documentation that there's uh, something on it that leads you to believe that it's not authentic, that it's not valid. You can absolutely go back to that individual and say, I'm very sorry, um, I've reviewed your documentation and I'm not comfortable accepting this to meet our requirements. Is there an alternate document that you can provide? So if you're going to do that, you want to be very, very certain that it's not uh, legitimate documentation for this reason. But I think those are the circumstances that you're better off declining unauthentic documentation because you're going to be attesting on the form that you've reviewed it and you believe it to be authentic. Yeah. And that comes with uh, penalties, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. If you attest it does. And it's wrong. Yeah. And, and a couple of other things, Joey, I wanted to toss in uh, just kind of as some you know, things to know, I, we've covered already so much about I-9s in such a short period of time, but one of the most common mistakes is also not completing it within three business days. So if you have a new hire, make it part of the process on the first day, give yourself, you know, kind of that two day cushion in case they don't bring the right docs or um, no docs at all. Um, and then the, the question we always get is, well, do we make copies or not make copies of the documents? And the correct answer is either, but just make sure you're consistent. So if you do it for one, then do it for the rest. And if you choose to retain documents, that's a company decision. And then probably one more thing, Joey, we can squeeze in here is talking a little bit about E-Verify because uh, I get this question all of the time, like, you know, E-Verify is essentially the electronic version of, like you still have to do an I-9, but right, verifying that eligibility to work and um, identity. But believe it or not, um, and depending on the state that you work in, uh, this may be a surprise to you, E-Verify is not required for every business. So E-Verify, uh, is applicable to government contractors. It's applicable to specific states. And there are some where it's totally optional. So if it's optional, then of course it's up to you. You're going to participate. But if you do, just make sure that you know that you're directly connected to these government agencies. And if you make one mistake, uh, such as not closing out the case, which is what they call the verification that you start, then you're uh, essentially telling them, hey, I'm over here making mistakes. And you may not want to be throwing up that red flag, uh, alerting them that you're making mistakes, especially if it's not something that you're required to do to begin with. Yeah, yeah, E-Verify can be a great tool because it gives you that double layer of security that uh, a person is who they say they are and that uh, the documents uh, ring true. Um, mm -hmm. I think another thing that I would say, an issue that I've seen is um, for individuals who are working and they are on visas, um, uh, immigrant visas or stu student visas, uh, 
documentation does expire. And so an I-9 mistake that I've seen is uh, either moving forward with expired documents or not circling back to confirm that a employee's documentation has been renewed. Uh, mm -hmm. That can get you in some trouble as well. So if you are presented with uh, some of those uh, documents, um, you want to make sure you're following the timeline. That's really solid advice, especially for those uh, those work authorizations that expire, because if the company is going to work with that team member to uh, get them an extended work authorization, that can be a lengthy process and you want to be, you know, you want to be starting it in enough time to be able to get, you know, to the status that you need before that worker expires. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you haven't seen this article and you want to learn more, I will drop it in the show notes for you to take a look uh, wherever you get this uh, podcast episode. And uh, if you need help with navigating those uh, Form I-9 waters, whether through remote or uh, your teams that are in person, um, check us out at jumpstart-hr.com. Now, Summer, you you didn't ask me you didn't ask me about my hat. I'm wearing a hat today. <laughs> I did notice that you were wearing a hat, and I thought, cool, BMW BMW Championship. <laughs> and I I kind of left it at that. But Joey, tell us about your hat. <laughs> okay, so fun story. Uh, you know, I've got this uh, this love affair with boating, and so I um, took a boating class uh, about this time last year. And um, when I was out there on the water, I actually lost this hat. Uh, not this one that I am wearing right now, but it was one that was similar from a BMW championship the year before. So I had to go to the next year's BMW championship and find a hat that I wanted to wear that was just like the other one. And similar to going out and finding a new hat, you might need to go and find new talent, but you may not always know where to look and you may not always know how much it will cost and you may not always know how to qualify the best talent. Uh, so just like you wear many hats in business, uh, one hat that we wear is a recruiter. Uh, we've got a dedicated recruiting team to tackle staffing agency uh, issues or staffing challenges for your organization, whether it be large or small. And so just like I went out and found my hat after I lost one, we'll go out and find your talent. So if you're in need of recruiting and staffing services, check us out at jumpstart-hr.com. And I can't wait to get Cody on, on a, an upcoming show so that he can talk more about our recruiting strategy and what makes us different uh, with our competitive rates and uh, top-notch uh, AI tools and uh, dedicated team. Uh, so let's get into consultants' corner. All right. That was that was such uh, that was such a cool segue, Joey. I was like, oh, let's. I want to hear about the story about this hat and uh, really appreciate where you took it. It lines up nicely with our consultants corner, which is where we talk about stories from the trenches. We take questions from you, our listeners and viewers, and we, we talk about uh, what we're seeing uh, in terms of trends and, and really just try to help you tackle some, some real life situations and, we thought it would be great to talk about the top reasons that employees quit and the value of conducting satisfaction surveys. We've talked about state interviews, uh, but also talking about exit interviews because especially now more than ever, it's really important to retain your top talent. And if you don't genuinely understand why your team members are leaving by the time they leave, or they've made that decision to leave, unfortunately, it's far too late. So Joey, let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the top reasons why team members quit and what companies might be able to do uh, to improve in that area so it's not 
not a concern for them. Some of the reasons why people quit, I'll just go with the first one and chat about it. Um, no room for advancement. So that's basically uh, maybe an a company, a individual's been at a company for quite a while and they're looking around and saying, hey, you know what? There's, there's no upward mobility here. There's no uh, opportunity for, for raises. There's no opportunity to, to learn new skills and grow. Uh, there's no uh, opportunity to get certification. So I'm out. I, I, I've mm -hmm. reached my, my capacity. Uh, there's nothing more for me to accomplish here. So I've got to leave. That's one reason why people leave companies. That's a tough one because I'm sure we've all been at one job at some point in our career where we've kind of looked around and we're like, well, where, where do I go next? You know, maybe it's that situation where the only other position for you to move in is your boss's role and they've been there, you know, 20 years and they're not going to leave anytime soon. So you kind of look around and go, well, like the only way for me to grow is out, but that's not true. I think there's definitely ways that you can help develop your team members within your organization, even if there isn't necessarily a role for them to move into now, but it's a matter of, finding those high performers, finding out what motivates them, what can you do to keep them engaged, to keep them growing, to help them see that there is a future there. And I think if you work closely with those team members, you can continue to retain them, but you might need to get a little creative on how you go about it. Yeah, I love that you say get creative because advancement doesn't look the same for everyone. Uh, some mm -hmm. people are quite happy in their role and want to be individual contributors, but maybe they've mastered what they're doing and they want to dabble in something else in the organization. Mm -hmm. So figuring out mm -hmm. uh, for that person, if it's cross-functional training that excites them. Uh, for other mm -hmm. people, it is absolutely going from, you know, junior level pro to mid-level pro to senior level pro. And so it's a career ladder sort of thing. Um, but you won't mm -hmm. know unless you have the conversations that we're suggesting with the uh, mm -hmm. satisfaction surveys and those uh, conversations, the one-on-ones with the, with the manager. And speaking of, uh, speaking of manager, there's another reason why, why people leave. What's, what's that next one? Well, I can, I, can definitely, I can definitely see why this is a big one. And it's somebody feeling like their boss lacks empathy. And if you've ever worked for a boss that you felt that way about, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It seems oh, yeah. like you're really just there to do a job. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You need to do your job. You need to show up. You need to be quiet. And it really just, it feels, the only way I can describe it is it just feels gross. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's sad. And I talk to many employees who I think they know that they're in that situation and it's not a great one, but for many reasons in regards to financial security, there's the fear of making that leap of like making a change. But if you've ever worked for amazing bosses, uh, and I'm very fortunate to have worked with many over the years, working with you, Joey, uh, you have the greatest degree of empathy and I would say it makes a whole world of difference. So I encourage leaders to think about how empathetic they are with their team and really think through how that, how those interactions and how that behavior has the ability to greatly impact their work satisfaction. And what's that saying, Joey, about people don't leave jobs, they leave bad bosses? Yeah. Yeah, that's totally right. That's totally right. People don't leave jobs, they leave bad bosses, because truly that is the most important relationship that an employee has in an organization is with his, his or her supervisor. And, you know, um, it's incredibly important. We, we still have the COVID pandemic uh, in our rear view mirror, right? Like it's still present. So if you are, if, if you have people on your team who were with you through that, one of the things that you have to think about is uh, a lot of people change jobs with, with a great resignation, 
because of lack of boss empathy around issues like childcare, family illness, flexible working hours, so on and so forth. And you still need a pulse check because folks may still be what I call sheltering in place uh, because maybe they don't, you know, to Summer's point, they don't think they're working for the best boss, but maybe it's uh, less risky to stay at their job now than to go out into the world and, and, and try to find another job. Um, but just because somebody's working for you doesn't mean they're working as well as they could. And so go back and visit and see, hey, is there anywhere we dropped the ball along the way that maybe you're still holding that chip on your shoulder or you know that grudge or that gripe or that disappointment? Uh, and if so, let's talk about it and see how we can uh, kind of put that behind us and uh, work together and move it forward. Really great advice, Joe. You want to take the next one? Yes, I do. And I appreciate you sharing with me because the next one is feeling undervalued and underutilized. So this is for people who uh, leave organizations because they don't get um, what they believe is the appropriate level of appreciation and recognition uh, and utilization. So what do we, what do we mean by that? It's someone who may be working full-time hours, but you're only assigning them part-time work. Or maybe they've worked so hard on something and sacrificed a ton that their supervisor might have known about. But unfortunately, when it came down to thank yous, um, they, they, weren't, they weren't there to be found. So uh, if there's anyone on your team that's feeling undervalued or underutilized, uh, you probably can track this because they're not ready to um, share ideas, thoughts, and opinions. Uh, if you ask for feedback on how to improve things, they're probably uh, quiet. Uh, but these might even be people who used to be the most talkative or the folks who had a lot of ideas that they would bring to the table. Mm -hmm. If that has slowed down, you'll want to you'll wanna ask why. And uh, they might, quite frankly, say, they're being undervalued or they feel uh, undervalued. Uh, but then with underutilized, if someone is underutilized, the way you can adjust that is to work with them and talk through their schedule and see if there are things that they are uh, not doing that they could be doing or opportunities for them to learn new things that uh, are of a benefit to you and to them. Um, so it's a collaborative effort if you want to turn things around for someone who's uh, feeling undervalued or underutilized. Uh, those are my thoughts, but what do, you, what do you think about that one, Summer? I definitely wanted to add to what you were saying, specifically in regards to the underutilized, because I think we've become pros at identifying candidates' superpowers. And I think if you were to ask members of your team what other skills or experience do they have that they may not necessarily be like utilizing within their role today that might benefit the organization? I think you might be surprised because, you know, sometimes individuals have worked in different, uh, totally different roles prior to joining your organization. So you might have hired them for a specific role. And then only to find out that they actually have this entirely different skill set that you actually need at your organization as well. And so that's underutilization. So really finding out what your team members' superpowers are and even asking them, are we fully utilizing your skill set? But to the answer is probably no. But if you, if you seek to understand what else they're capable of, and if there is a way for them to apply that into your organization, well, now everybody wins. And that's the goal of helping your team members not only feel that, they're, that they have a greater value, a greater contribution to the organization, but that they're being utilized at a higher level. Yeah, I, I agree. That's great advice. And I mean, I could talk stories about our team uh, having folks who were uh, realtors, uh, marketing pros, um, teachers in a former life, like 
there's so much rich talent on our team and uh it's it's awesome to work with with everyone on the team and and be able to tap into those those strengths because you know some people um and I'm not necessarily talking about our our team but just in general some people take occupations and things that they find occupations because that's like the steady income right but if you really ask them you know what well, what would you be doing if money weren't an issue and they tell you oh you know i uh i studied for i got my yoga certification but you know covid hit and i couldn't find any classes hiring well there you have someone who can lead you know uh meditations or yoga practice for your team uh if if they're if they're into it or maybe someone who says um even just like skills so um if someone on your team is bilingual and there becomes a need to uh translate documents for a client or to serve as a bilingual witness for something um that's a that's a way to utilize talents and skills um we're we're running a little bit over on on time so i want to just go through these these last three really quickly and then summer you can kind of close it out with uh like the the key points and in, in, in the show, but um, the obvious one is people leave for uh, pay and benefits. Um, there's a there's a whole conversation you can have about this one, but you know, just making sure that you're uh, always looking out at the pay and benefits, and are we giving something that's fair, equitable? Um, you know, do we have a clear pay philosophy, and are we applying it? Uh, workload. Uh, Kind of the opposite side of the underutilized part, but you know maybe there's just too much work to go around, and uh, people need a break. And then overall company culture, you know, uh, some people may say that oh our our culture is is this, uh, but your culture is really what your people say it is. And if they say that it's uh, resulting in burnout, stress, anxiety, uh, what have you, that's where you'll start to see uh, individuals leaving your team. Um, Summer, what do you have for, for parting thoughts or comments you want to leave from this week's consulting corner? Well, I'll definitely say that this is just a short list. Of course, there's many other reasons that employees quit, but I think these are really the top reasons that we see and drawing, drawing it back to the very beginning where, you know, what prompted this conversation, it it was us talking about the value of satisfaction surveys and exit interviews. And so if you aren't currently doing those to get a pulse on your organization uh, prior to individuals leaving, you definitely want to put those in place so that you can start to measure and assess how you're performing in these areas and more. And when it comes to exit interviews, of course, at that point, somebody has already made the decision to leave, but don't overlook the value of those because team members are more likely going to give you valuable feedback when they don't feel like they have anything to risk at that point. So ask the tough questions, gather the information, but most importantly, Joey, I would say please do something meaningful with the information that's gathered from exit interviews because there's nothing nothing worse than a team member really taking the time to share with the intent of wanting to improve the workplace for the team members left behind and they take the time and share all of this information and the organization does absolutely nothing about it couldn't agree more Couldn't agree more well as always, we're dropping helpful tips for you to be a better leader of your small business or small team. We talked about the uh, importance of Form I-9 and getting the documentation right and not refusing documents from team members that are eligible documents. Uh, and we talked about uh, individuals leaving your team and why they quit and the importance of satisfaction surveys and exit interviews. Uh, if you love this show, there's a whole bunch more where this came from on YouTube and podcast outlets. So go ahead and uh, subscribe to those uh, areas and check us out on LinkedIn where we go live uh, every week for the full show. So uh, I'll just leave with, you know, check us out on on our website, jumpstart-hr.com. If you love the show, give a five star review, share it with your friends and colleagues, and we will see you next week. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, everyone.